On this episode of Law Weekly, we discuss issues of security and particularly the offenses of kidnapping and banditry. Are they federal offenses? We have the views of a former national legal advisor of the All Progressive Congress, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Moise Banire. Also on the program today, Lagos State pushes for the implementation of the state's special people's law, especially at the local government level. Plus our recap of some of the top stories from the courts. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Shuyeli. It was on Tuesday, May 4th, that the Minister of Information, Alajilai Mohammed, said that it was not the responsibility of the federal government to prosecute suspected kidnappers and bandits as they were not federal offenses. These comments have generated a lot of interest, with many expressing the view that the minister got it wrong. Law Weekly spoke to senior advocate of Nigeria, Dr. Moise Banire, who in the recent past served as the national legal advisor of the APC. Does he share the view of the Minister of Information? Here's his take on that and other issues. We should assume it was as usual quoted out of context. You know, that's our usual way of trying to address the, this kind of situation because uh, as a lawyer, I'm not too sure that uh, it was said that affirmatively. Uh, that certainly is not correct. It's not correct. You only need to just look at ordinary terrorism act. It covers virtually everything that is happening around us. In fact, I recall, if you look at the definition section, section one, I think specifically 2C or so, in fact, you will find kidnapping expressly stated there. Then beyond that, all other components of terrorism itself clearly reflect banditry or includes banditry and all other crimes associated with it. So if you take the terrorism act alone, which is a federal act, then certainly you will know that that position can never be true. Now, that is one aspect of it. The technical aspect of it that is sought to rely on is to just say, look, since most states, you find that in recent, apart from the criminal laws that they have, most are gradually or progressively, specifically enacting laws on kidnapping because of the gratuity of the event this day and the nature. They are taking it out of the ordinary criminal laws into a specific legal regime. Maybe that misled him into believing that there's only states that alone that are dealing with the issue of kidnapping, but that's not correct in law. And uh, beyond that also, the issue of banditry certainly is covered under terrorism. But be that as it may, even let's assume without considering that it's right. The reality is that the extent to which the state are responsible relate only to the enforcement machinery. That is, issues of administration of criminal justice. In other words, as are the states of charging them to court, which law are you going to charge them under, specifically? But when it comes to the issue of detection, investigation, surveillance, arrest, uh, even arrangement in some instances, there are all federal issues. Yes. Who controls the Nigerian police? Who controls the state security, civil defense, and a whole lot of other enforcement organs, I mean, security uh, organs? It's the federal government. So it's a contradiction in time to say that it's the state. The only aspect of the state they can relate with is when it comes to the issue of enforcement. Beyond that, all the basics rest squarely with the federal government. Do you then share the views? Because like you've said, and some other people have also argued, all these are acts of terrorism, which some people say falls under the prosecutorial powers of the AGF. Do you then agree that this perhaps demonstrates the, the lack of commitment or, I don't know, on the part of the federal government to deal decisively with these insecurity issues that we have in the country? There are a lot of psychological, sociological issues that are involved with this. Nobody is studying all these things. It's never done abroad. And this is that happens somewhere. You just want to go and arrest and arrange them before the because that ought to eat. You would not be interested in knowing what could have propelled that action. What mindset is behind yes. it? Yes. You must study it in order for you to be able to apply the necessary antidote to it. But the way we go here, we go so mechanical. And that is why in my very strong view, we are not getting any results. For example, like I used to say, I said, okay, you talk about banditry. You don't need to travel far. You don't, it's no requirement from the statistics that we have. Even as challenged as those statistics are, 
We don't need to go far. If you are having over 45% youth unemployment, over 35% of general employment, and you are saying that you don't want to have banditry, how? It's just a joke. We are clowning. That's the reality. So for me, the first area of attention certainly is poverty alleviation. There must be a very, very conscious and much more aggressive way of addressing the issue of poverty in the land. It's just too much, too much. In fact, it's so bad, like I used to tell people that even the enforcement uh, of security agencies we are constantly deploying all over the open, they are equally affected. <laughs> There's something somewhere. There is a disconnect somewhere. That's the reality. So for me, our intelligence must be strengthened. And that is the foundation of all these things. Without intelligence, we are just joking. How many people do? You can't use force to resolve all these issues. They are just beyond force. They are just beyond. You have to do enough even studies for some of us, maybe it's because of our background. When issues of this nature are happening, you want to do a proper diagnosis before you can have a prognosis. But if you don't do that, you just say, oh, this is the way it should be done. Just deploy, deploy. It can work. That's by very strongly, it can work. So the, in summary, the point I'm struggling to make is that it goes beyond the office of the attorney general to just be arranging people before the court. Where is even the court anyway? Do you even have the court now? There was also something that you touched on that I thought was very key, intelligence. And all the security issue again brings to the fore the arguments some have made for the decentralization of the police, state police. Do you, with all the um, disadvantages of it that's been pointed out that governments will appropriate them and we're just exchanging one evil for the other, but do you think that it's strongly time to move in that direction? It's overdue, long overdue, long overdue. Like you rightly said, most of the uh, negatives, if I can put it, that we have against state police are potential. Well, let's assume without considering that they are there, they are real. Positive thinking is that we should start addressing it by way of checks and balances. How do you control them? Let's put in place internal control towards checkmating those potential abuses. Simple and straightforward. But we cannot throw the baby and the bathwater away. The consequence is what we are witnessing today. That's what we are witnessing. So for me, it's something that is uh, overripe. I hear what you say about state police. I hear what you say about tackling the poverty issue. But where do you think that the government is getting it wrong? Well, in the first instance, I'm not too sure there is uh, proper coordination. One, among the agencies of government. Two, the security agencies themselves, particularly the intelligence community. Three, even addressing the welfare of those people where you are deploying. I just told you a scenario. I just painted a picture to you now. You see, there is something I always describe as malicious obedience to love order. That is greatly what is happening now. You give a, a, a superior give directive. The man says, yes, sir, done. He leaves that place. He does the opposite. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And this is what is going on. So there must be a way of addressing all these components, not in the manner in which we are dealing with them now. Because it's, to me, from my experience, it appears we operate in silos. And it can work. This thing has to, yes, this one intelligence community will sit down and look at it, OK, I need so, so, so number of vehicles to track on me from which I need this technology. Uh, so I make my submission. I send it to the presidency. I say, give me money and go and buy. Uh, Air Force will wake up tomorrow, the same issue, raise the same thing again. I mean, we, no, it can't work. There's no synergy. You must get everybody to sit down together and say, okay, for the entire country, for example, what do we need? For this, in terms of intelligence, in terms of physical ammunition, in terms of uh, men, personnel, and all those issues. And that is what I believe is very, very necessary to be done. Otherwise, what this one we are doing now, the, the, the amazing one is when they say submit, 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 what, what kind of submit? It's not about submit, it's about sitting down professionally and dealing with all these issues, particularly the intelligence aspect of it. It's the most important, it's, it's not limited 
to the security personnel. They need to get sociologists, get psychologists, get people from the social science, the social scientists involved in this. Yeah, there is a way that we undermine those experts. Whereas they are crucial. They are very, very crucial from my own experience internationally. You need all these social scientists to do a lot of analysis for you and be able to guide you in arriving at the solution. Away from issues of security, let's come back to issues of the profession. The Senate recently rejected a bill to limit the number of appeals that go before the Supreme Court. Do you think that there's a need to revisit that bill or is their action justified? I certainly it must be revisited. It's a decision that we're thought out. Because the reality is that you just must limit it. In how many jurisdictions do you find the number of cases that we find at the Supreme Court? APS Court. Where is it done? Where? Maybe they don't know how ridiculous some of these cases could be. People disputing over a shop in Onisha, going to Supreme Court, your APS court, balance ship, issue of disputation of or maybe debt of one million naira going to Supreme Court. It's even embarrassing. So certainly you must delimit it. Certainly you must. It's not a matter for debate. For me, all these political matters should not even go there again. All these political matters should not go there again. There's no point. Then I deal with issues of uh, maybe at best criminality, criminal matters, issues bordering on terrorism and all those ones, and maybe at best constitutional matters. That's all that should be going there, not all these other uh, ballet ship uh, or bar ship contests. I know. I believe we are just ridiculing them. I just, that's why we are not getting results. You even know now, you file a serious civil matter, if you are lucky, it will be taken the next 15 years. Does that make sense? It doesn't. Even if at the end of the day you win, it's meaningless. And you are saying that there should not be uh, self help. Ah. Self help will continue to be on the rise. That's the reality. The day they are victims, they will realize what we are talking about. The day they become victim of it, it's because most election cases, uh, uh, petition cases, they have them determining within 60, 70, they, they, they are happy with that one. But the one that touches on the life of an average Nigerian, cases that are suffering there, commercial cases that are there for 15 years, these are cases ordinarily that you have led to the creation of employment and the stemming of the insecurity in the country. We are not taking their security. All this has their own multiply effect that they are not seeing and they must see. Otherwise, we are all collectively endangered. I want to also talk about the Jusun strike. There seems to be a stalemate in the, in the negotiations um, between the state government and Jusun. But what do you think can be done to compel the state governments to obey court judgments on the matter? And do you think that executive order number 10 is enforceable? Well, executive order number 10, you know it's not enforceable. Let's put that aside. But for me, now is the time that we have to start putting our ass in order. What do I mean by this? In other words, looking inward. The attorney generals of the, first, uh, of the federal state, are they not lawyers? Yeah. They are lawyers. What is our body doing about it? Are they not meant to be the people to advise or enforce those judgments? <laughs> Let's go back. They called the meeting of all the attorney generals of the federal state and said, look, this is the position of law that a judgment, this judgment must be obeyed. And you are the chief law officer. You have an option. It's either you go and resign or at the end of the day we debar you. The NBA should be saying this to them. That's what the NBA should be saying by now. Uh, by the time a governor changes attorney general four or five times, he retired himself and start learning how to abide by the law. Something drastic must happen. The mistake that we are making is to continuously think that the struggle is about members of Jusun alone. No, in fact, it has nothing to do, it has no nexus with them. It's not about their welfare. It's not about the welfare of judges. It's about justice, simply sister. In other words, how do we serve justice to everybody without fear of a favor? How do we ensure that the judiciary is truly and properly independent of the executive. That is the struggle. That is what it's all about. And it affects every Nigerian. Because, like I said, in recent times, beyond even litigant, even members of people are beginning to think that even if you have a matter involving a state government, 
before a state goes, you are not likely to get justice. So by the time we are getting to that level, we must be watchful. We must start sending that note of warning to everybody to say, if everybody loses confidence in this system, the option is to take law into their hand. And what is that? What does that imply? What does that translate to? Anarchy. We have enough in our We are still struggling with enough. Banditry, kidnapping, arson, all the answer, all manner. Now you want to add that to it? That will accelerate the demise of the country and say, oh. So Nigerians must, as a matter of urgency, see this struggle as everybody's struggle. That we must ensure. And what is the message? Comply with the constitution, comply with government. Nothing beyond that. That's all that the whole strike is all about. Comply with the tenet or the dictate of the constitution which you swore to uphold. Finish. Welcome back. We turn our attention now to the Special People's Law. Lagos State is pushing for its implementation, especially at the local government level. We have details of that in this report showing the highlights from a one-day workshop on the law and its inclusion at the grassroots. Other than a mandate on a wheelchair. The World Report on Disability, published in 2011, shows that about 25 million Nigerians had at least one disability, while 3.6 million of these had very significant difficulties in functioning. Your kind of relationship with people. people with disabilities in Nigeria typically receive little support from the government and instead rely on family members, non-governmental organizations and religious groups. One of their biggest obstacles is the stigma surrounding their disabilities, which excludes them socially, economically, and politically. With the passage of a disability law in Lagos State, ensuring the implementation of the law at all levels is key. So the state's Office for Disability Affairs brings together senior officials of some local governments to chart a new course. It is not so much about my disability, but the society that have not created the environment for my different kind of ability to manifest. For example, if you go to uh, any bank today, there's hardly how somebody like me on a wheelchair can enter the bank. So does it mean that I, I, don't, I don't have any money to keep in the bank or I have no business in the bank? So it is the society that have disabled me because it has failed to create room for me. The law creates the need for inclusion, especially for specially able people, but guaranteeing the opportunities for them at the level of government closest to the people needs a push. Um, when somebody has a challenge, um, the, the nearest place, if you like, the most accessible place to go to is the local government office. So we believe that if we build their capacity to address concerns about persons with disability, then it would be more like ensuring that citizens at the local government level also have access to their rights. I mean, persons with disabilities, that they have access to um, help, that they have um, an easy place where, you know, a quick place where they can go to to report, you know. There's always that interaction, that linkage between the local government and state government. There's no state government without local government because, of course, um, the um, information, the data from local government feeds into the state government and also feeds into the planning of the state government. For an official of the Oshodi local government, empathy rather than pity is necessary to ensure that people living with disabilities have equal opportunities. We have to go beyond the level of sympathy, you know, the level of pity. Because most of the time when we do it in the, in the aspect or perspective of, being, of pitying these people, we might not be getting you know, the actual treatments. They might not even be getting what they ought, what they will be desiring from the local government. We, they will prefer and how to, as far as what I've learned today, we will prefer it to be in a kind of empathic situation where we put ourselves so we'll be able to know exactly what they are needed. Not just looking at them from that perspective of, ah, these are disabled, let's help them. We're not helping them. You understand, we are, they, are, they are normal like us. And even though they have that disability, we should see them not in a kind of pity form, but in a way that they too will know that these people are seeing them as, as human beings and being treated as such. 
So I think that is one of the things that we need to, you know, put more into our efforts at helping this disability. And it's not all bad as the Lasoda boss enumerates the changes that have happened in public infrastructure owing to the law. Things are getting better for people with disability, at least in Lagos State that I know. You know, the awareness, the level of awareness is increasing. I hope you know that all the BRT buses in this administration, all of them have ramp access for persons with disability. It doesn't used to be like that. There's an improvement. In the past few years, there has been no bridge constructed in Lagos State that does not have the ramp access for people with disability. And I can tell you authoritatively that even at the Secretariat, there are every ministry and parastatal uh, has designated parking spaces for persons with disability. It is getting better. And don't forget also, um, just on the 30th of December, the governor did make a commitment that the, um, the Lagos State is going to look into inclusive education to make our education more uh, accessible and comfortable for people with disability, children with special need. You know, uh, he made commitments to ensure that people with disability are not left behind. This is in actualization of that commitment. And a lot more like that are still going to come, uh, are, are still uh, coming, are going to be unfolding very soon. The Lagos State Special People's Law, June 2011, seeks to uphold the rights of all persons living with any form of disability in Lagos State by safeguarding them against all forms of discrimination and giving them equal rights and opportunities. And on the home stretch, we bring you a recap of some of the activities from the courtrooms. <laughs> The Supreme Court on Friday, May 7th, affirmed the power of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, to deregister political parties. In arriving at its decision, the court dismissed an appeal filed by the National Unity Party, NUP. NUP was one of the 74 political parties deregistered by INEC in February 2020. The NUP had challenged INEC's decision, but Justice Chimangweze, who delivered the lead judgment, held that the deregistration of the party was done in line with the law and compliance with the extant provisions of the Constitution and Electoral Act. In yet another suit, the Supreme Court has faulted the dissolution of the local government administrations in Oyo and Katsina states. The court noted that their replacement with caretaker committees was illegal and unconstitutional. The court awarded costs in favor of the appellants while also ordering that all the outstanding salaries and allowances of the sacked council chairmen and councillors should be paid. <laughs> Away from the Supreme Court, the five-week-old industrial action embarked on by the judiciary staff workers in Nigeria continues as a second conciliatory meeting with the federal government on Thursday failed to reach a consensus. An attempt to hold this meeting two weeks ago failed as the union staged a walkout. At the resumption of the meeting, led by the Minister of Labour and Employment, Senator Chris Ngige, he expressed optimism that the issues will be resolved soon. He also says that the federal government has met 90% of the workers' demands and cannot proceed until the courts are reopened. Today we are ravaged by bandits and uh, terrorism and uh, robbery, arson. With the courts closed, the police cannot charge people to court. So we need uh, to do something urgently. The leaderships of the judiciary and parliamentary workers, however, insist that their demand for financial autonomy is a constitutional provision that cannot be negotiated. The implementation of the financial autonomy for the judiciary, which is sacrosanct to us and according to the law. So we're only here for the implementation. The meeting then proceeded into a closed-door session, after which the union say they have been given a document to study before reaching a decision. So, we are not yet uh, given the documents, yes, the rules. But it's been promised that we're going to be given to go back to our people to look at it. But what is for real, what is the truth is, the strike is still on until otherwise. And that's our program this week. Don't forget that you can find these and past episodes of the program on our YouTube page. I'm Shala Shaley. Thank you for watching and see you next week.